the voice of Anthony Mackie will be followed by his body. <laughs>
uh, Soderbergh level of cast like this uh, to, uh, to to put down dramatic scenes uh, on camera, especially uh, with with actors of this caliber who've been playing these parts for this long. Uh, th those are some of the easiest things we do. So the hardest things we do uh, is is the is executing the action. And I think the, the toughest sequence by far in this film, which we literally probably just finished a, a, a week or two ago, was uh, was the airport sequence. Uh, it's filled with a lot of moving parts, a lot of different characters. You want to move each character forward. You want to make sure that you're not leaving anybody behind. Uh, um, and uh, and you know I think we we, we went well into the post process, still reshaping and rethinking and, and reconfiguring that sequence to make sure that it had its, its maximum. Uh, a storytelling thrust to it. All right, now over on that side, right there, please. I'm Yuka from Japan. Uh, thank you for having us today. So, Mr. Ebon showed great fun wrestling against Mr. Downey Jr. at Kids Dress Award. That was hilarious. So, I'd like to ask this question to all of you. Uh, if you challenge someone in Team Iron Man to a battle, uh, what kind of game would you dare? Who is your opponent and why? Chris. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't get all of it. <laughs> I got a lot of it. <laughs> if I what would Team Iron Man? What was the bubble? You got a bubble? Yeah. If you challenge Team Iron Man in a bubble. Battle. Battle. <laughs> Who would you fight against? Who would I fight against? Who would you fight against? Yeah. Yeah. In the battle. Uh, well, I'd probably want to aim low. You know, you don't want to fight Vision because he's going to destroy you. Um, I don't know. I think, you know, in order to survive, I'd probably take Black Widow because she's human. Um, you know, but, but out of, out of it, from a character standpoint, probably Iron Man, who's our character, obviously, has the most friction. Oh. And so I think I think she was more talking about you know some game that you did at the Kids Choice Award. Bye. So like you know what kind of oh, game? The thumb war you did at Kids Choice Award. Oh, the thumb war. Yeah. So you know so what kind of other games like you maybe you want to? What other other games? Oh, sorry. Yeah, right. Yeah, what will happen now? Uh, what other kind of games? Uh, you know, I get a lot of questions when you when we when we shot that scene in the airport. Everyone kind of was like, "Did, did anyone get the impulse to play Red Rover?" <laughs> and I'm surprised we didn't. That would be a good one. <laughs> That's my answer. Hi, Angela Dawson, Fargo Features. My question actually is for all the actors. I wanted to ask you about doing that airport sequence and and how that was for you. How many days it was? What was the most challenging part of that? And were you satisfied when you saw the finished product? Yeah, it was great. I mean, it's hot. It's Atlanta in August, so I think everyone was, was toasty. Um, and there's only a couple scenes where, you know, a couple shots where, you know, you might have that one 50-50 where everyone's running together. But for the most part, it's picks and pops, and you're just getting pieces. So it's a lot of waiting around, but you, you really have a, a confidence that this is going to be something special. You can see Anthony and Joe's face, and Kevin, these guys are so excited when these moments work. Um, it's, it's a meticulous process because it's such a grand scheme. So on the day, it's not as, as cool and romantic as you think it would be, but, but th there's an energy on set and, and an excitement that, that keeps you invested, uh, knowing that it's going to be something epic. But it's hot. <laughs> we'll say that. And these guys run really fast, and I'm in heels, of oh. course it. And I really wanted everyone to slow down, slow down. just a little bit. No. And I no, didn't was get that. Slow down. No. And I no. just was pumping those arms and falling behind and then taking off. Yeah, so it's fine. Yeah. So <laughs> so 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 I was like, I'll just get up in the air. <laughs> was there a lot of was there a lot of like wire stuff? Were you attached to things? I wish I got to do more, but I think just because of time reasons, I didn't get to do as much as I would like. I did landings. Might have been a nice breeze at that point, yeah. maybe. Nice. All right, over there, please. Uh, Mark, nice. Hughes Stand with, up. Mark Hughes with Forbes. Um, Paul, when you say, I believe this belongs to you, Captain America, <laughs> was that improvised? And how many other different lines? I mean, did you try out several different 
ways of saying that because that just seems so you and was such a amazing moment. And Jeremy, Till the Messenger is amazing. I love the film. I just wanted to say that. That's exactly how you sound. <laughs> I don't know. I think that was in the. I think that was always in the script. The uh, I think this belongs to you. We, you know, we sometimes would play around with lines and stuff while we're shooting, and these guys uh, uh, would suggest things, and but and then sometimes we'd come up with the things after the fact. One of the great things about having a mask. Is that if you think of a great joke afterward, you don't have to, you don't have to match it to anything, so you can add something in an ADR. But that was, I think that was one that was, that was always in there. Um, actually, this is still following to you, Paul, because, uh, you know, Spider Man's been sort of. Uh, <laughs> Chris, Chris, I remember like a few years ago when you made the first Captain American 
I told you that Captain America was kind of controversial in Latin America for different reasons, but it's been an like, interesting evolution your character. Uh, he was supposed to be like protecting the, the, the true, like the old American values, and in this case, he's just rejecting uh, the, con the, the government control, and maybe yeah. the United Nations. I would like you to talk about that. That's very interesting. This one, the, the, the sure. way it's acting, right? Well, with regards to but whether, you know, that was always a concern whether, you know, the name America, whether or not that would kind of uh, uh, polarize certain audiences. But the truth is, the, 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 the name America, I mean, what he stands for is something that's ubiquitous across the world, but in you know, what he believes in, you know, honor and morality and values, that's something you can find anywhere. But in terms of who he's been throughout the arc of his character, you know, he's always kind of fought for the greater good. He's always trying to put the needs of the masses before his own desire. And that's exactly what's different in this film. Instead of the kind of, uh, whoops, that, that you know, we're gonna lap for a second. Um, and instead of kind of uh, dedicating himself to what others need, uh, in this film he kind of prioritizes what he wants which is a departure from what he's normally allegiant to. So, so I think it's, it's, again, it colors the character in a really nice way. Um, you know, you're the guy who's this incredibly austere and, and moral character. It's hard trying to find ways to make him layered and dynamic. And I think in this movie, he becomes potentially selfish, where, where he kind of puts his own desires first. But it's rooted in family, which is, I think, a, it is a true line that we can all relate to. Speaking of family, Jeremy, I wanted to ask you, uh, as we got to know Hawkeye more, uh, how do you, why do you feel that he joined Cap's side immediately in this film? He's what we call
direct that to you, Sebastian, because I think in this movie, uh, why does Chris talk when he shouldn't? <laughs> Only Bucky knows. We, like, he doesn't know a nope. way. Like, this movie felt like, like we get Bucky back Do in we? a way. Yeah. Right. And so is there what was what was your process like in this film as opposed to Winter Soldier when he's not himself, he's not the captain? Well, just to piggyback on what Chris said, you know, I think I'm always fascinated about the same thing. It's just, you know, for example, our writers, Christopher and Stephen, it's just phenomenal to me the way that they were able to write a script that gave every character a moment, an arch, uh, you know, an arc, and, and particularly, I think they were the ones that kind of figured it to the temperature of, of Bucky Barnes, you know, how much of the guy is, is back from the first movie, how much of the Winter Soldier's there, and, and for me, it was just sort of taking it off the page and, and following them, you know. Uh, but a lot of that, I think, is determined in the in the writing, and then also in the decision that these guys make. You know, and the fun part for me is I never know, you know, uh, where they're going to take it. So. In the last movie, I remember you were practicing your knife work with the plastic silverware. Yeah, this well, is I was me driving. imitating you, by the way. Um, <laughs> did you do? Were you keeping that up this time, or did you not need it? No, I didn't do that. Nice. <laughs> nice. <laughs> no. All right, put the mic on the side. We're right ahead. Uh, Trevor Norkey, MoviePilot.com. I have a question for Elizabeth. Mm -hmm. um, so in Age of Ultron, you were all like scared of your powers, and then in Civil War, you started to gain some confidence, but you still could not really control, and you're still terrified of your powers. Do you think Scarlet Witch will ever be able to have any confidence, with, like real confidence with her powers, or do you think this is the peak of her confidence level? I mean, I, I think what ended up happening is she was starting to feel confident. That it was more, it wasn't about her powers, it was more about um, the, the conflict she had with making a big mistake. Um, but I think what's interesting is every superhero has a weakness, and I've always thought of hers as um, she's the person who gets in her way, um, that she's kind of limit, limitless. Um, and so that's to me an interesting character trait. I don't know what we're going to do next, but. Um, I'm, I think of her as being like an incredibly strong, powerful person, and I, and it's also fun because I feel like she she could flip either way because of her um, her mind. I think she I think there are a lot of things that could possibly play with that I'm not in control of that. Um, but I think this film was a lot about just conflict in general um, of what's right, um, how to use your abilities or whether you should or not. I think that's, that was a consistent thing throughout the whole film. So I think it was just consistent with that as opposed to her being not confident. She is on a growth arc. Yeah. Uh, it, is, uh, it is part of her development. It's very tricky with very powerful characters because unless they have an internal struggle or a flaw that limits them, then they do become limitless. And then the storytelling becomes um, muddled and, and, and not very interesting. Yeah. Uh, you know, she could have stopped that flight at the airport in, in, in five seconds if she were the peak of her power. So, uh, it really, you know, really has to do with, um, um, you know, her character specifically going on a journey to understand uh, uh, what the limits of her power are, her powers are. She makes a mistake very early in the movie that sets her back, and, uh, and you know, we'll, we'll, we'll get to see where she goes in the film. All right, over on that side. Hey guys, I'm Joe May at Philadelphia Daily News. My question, um, two of them. One for Chris. Um, I, one of my most touching moments, I mean, the human side, um, saying goodbye to um, Peggy, and then also the joy of finally making a pass for the first time in 75 years. And um, for, <laughs> for Kevin, um, for, um, the joy of making a pass to oh, the chair. Oh, sure, sure. sure. Yeah. 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 75 yeah. years. I guess I make out. And um, for Kevin, um, it seems like you have a pleasant problem. <laughs> it's like, I think after this film, everybody had such a high point. Um, everybody can carry their own solo film. People are going to be clamoring for Captain America 4 and maybe a War Machine movie, and that would be a good idea. And how do you um, deal with that pleasant problem? Wait, what was that? How do you deal with what? How do you deal with that pleasant problem? The other one, everyone, great. Hey, listen, that, that's, that's, listen, Marvel's, and I'm, I'm, you know, I've been really talking a lot about this in press, but it really is, over the course of the, you know, I've been doing this for a while now, and it really is nice to kind of step back in the first couple of years of your, 
involvement of the franchise, you're very internal, you're scared about being the thing that's going to cause it. You're going to be awful in your very terrified and very egoic manner. But as you kind of continue on the journey, you kind of realize how amazing it is what they're doing and what they're accomplishing and how fortunate you are to be a part of it. This unbelievable interwebbing of, of stories and you kind of are just so uh, fortunate to be a part of it. And I say, keep going. Let's keep going. Let's let the wave get bigger and bigger because it's not stopping. It's not like they're making bad movies. They're making great movies. And you want to you keep putting in this superhero box, you can. But the fact is, it's still good movies. Good movies that, that they, especially the Russos, they ground them in such an authentic way. It's real humans, real struggles, real conflict. Good cinematic storytelling with like a streak of superhero flavor in it. So I say, keep going. Like if you can keep doing it, keep doing it. It's funny you were saying that because I actually had a moment the other day where I was thinking that when I was going over the Back, Back to the Future trilogy, and to me, like I feel like <laughs> they're going to remember this this trilogy the same way. That's how I feel. It's, it's amazing. It's amazing that it's happening. It's unprecedented, and it's it's. I don't know how you do it outside of the the, the use of the existing properties of the comic book world, and it's and they they've got a monopoly on. They got it. They're doing it. No one else can try and copy. It, you know what I mean? It's it's really unbelievable to try and venture out into these uncharted waters and do it so well. It it's just really impressive. What was the first part of the question? Yeah, there was something else that I was scared about answering. Oh, Peggy Carter. Yeah, I didn't Make want it out. Start. Okay, that's right. Yeah, make it out. Yeah, that's the best. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's the best. Uh, you know, um, it certainly has a nice element of Steve's trouble. You know, you got, you know, it's like when you have friends you had from high school and you try and make your friends from high school get along with your friends from college. You, you, it's, it's, it's this blending of the world, and Steve has this part of him where it's Bucky and Peggy from his old life, and then he has this new family. And this movie makes these worlds collide. Um, and it's typical and challenging, and it's certainly <coughs> loss. Well, we all know the movie, right, guys? Anna? Anna? Loss of Peggy. <laughs> the loss of Peggy certainly makes Bucky the last remaining part of Steve that is uh, a part of his, his old self, his, his, his memory of home, of who he is before this shield, you know, and it sounds stupid, sorry. Just it's who Steve was before he you know, had this responsibility. Um, but they, they are, it's kind of even Thank you, get in there, please. <laughs> just, just take over, I don't know what I'm saying. Uh, I didn't know what I was saying, but it's, it's nice to, you know, when you lose Peggy, Bucky becomes so much more meaningful, and, and it really becomes, um, that's what motivates Steve to become Selfish. You, know, it, it, you got the most selfless guy in, in, in comic books all of a sudden saying, I care a little bit more about my relationship than what it means to you guys. And, and he's, he's taking his current family. The guy's only looking for a place to fit. He's looking for home. And he's found it with his current Avengers, but fuck, he's that Achilles heel. And it's, it's impossible pitting that against his current family. He chooses his old family, which is, again, a little bit of a selfish thing, but that's something he's never done before, and it's, it's new territory, and it's, it's a gray area that he has, and he's a very, Joe uses this, and I love it, he's, Steve's a very binary guy, it's this or that, and, and with Bucky, it becomes gray, and I think it's, it's tough for him, and he, he chooses Bucky. So there you go, in Civil War, Cap, he's 90, he's selfish, he loves me. He's 90, he's selfish, and he just wants to get kissed. I love it! <laughs> That's all the time that we've got you guys. Thank you so much to Team Chapman.